I was going to ask uh, Mark Barnabar to, uh, to kick off. Um, it's been a dramatic few weeks um, and I think overall a tough year in the markets. Um, both equities, finance, there's not really a, a lot of joy out there. Um, I just, we've got a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines, Mark. What's, what's the short term looking like um, from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, look, the headline for me would be subdued business activity, but some green shoots. Um, and, you know, I've, I've tried to break that down into a few points. The first is, in terms of corporate activity, it is relatively low. I mean, if you measure that, for example, by, uh, at least in, in what I do, mergers and acquisitions, uh, it is still on a historical basis well below uh, benchmark. Plenty of transactions, but hard to close them. Um, and they're hard to close because there is still a lot of volatility. And uh, at least in, in my world, volatility is the hardest thing to try and transact around. So uh, it has improved the last four or six weeks have certainly, in terms of the markets, uh, been better. Um, anyone that works in the financial markets will, will follow the VIX. It's uh, a kind of universal now measure of risk um, from the Chicago Board Exchange on traded options. That probably is at the lowest point it's been in the last five years. Uh, this number trades at about 13 14% currently. It got up to uh, 70% uh, at the height of the crisis. So, look, it M&A activity is... Uh, is low, but I think some, some calmness has actually re-entered the market and that should help. Equity volumes um, are also relatively low. So that's measured by the number of shares traded in any one day, either number of shares or by dollar volume. And you know, you just have to read the papers to realise that there aren't many IPOs taking place, there aren't many secondary issuances taking place, um, placements, rights issues, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, you know, our market has done it tough compared to, uh, indeed, our European but also our US counterparts. Our interest rates uh, are relatively high, so we've got uh, a different option in terms of where to invest. And we're suffering from the, the fact, I think, that international funds are reluctant to come into the Australian market to buy equities. And it's not because they don't like our companies, it's because they don't want to take risk on our dollar. Um, for an international fund to buy an Australian equity, you are taking two risks. The first is that the market will rise, but the second is that the dollar will stay where it is um, or improve. As I said, though, there are some green shoots. I think it was the first month for Macquarie in recent months, in the last 20 or so months, where the, uh, the quantity of, of growth coming back into the equities markets exceeded term deposits, and that's a, a very good sign. Look, we're also... Uh, effectively seeing a few other things in, the, in business which we haven't seen before um, and are interesting and, and are making life a little more demanding. Um, the first is the decoupling of the Reserve Bank cash rate and term deposit rates. Um, you know, Troy's in a good position to talk about it. He's an economist. But normally well, the Reserve Bank cash rate is 3.5%. Um, a lot of good bankers in here, but you can put your money in the bank and get, you know, 5.1, 5.2% six months. That is actually causing uh, a lot of money to sit on the sidelines. It is causing people to have an alternative to investing in the market that um, the United States, Europe, with effectively uh, money at zero uh, percent, don't have. And uh, it's difficult to see how that will change quickly. Reducing the reserve... Bank cash rate doesn't translate into the commercial banks reducing their rate. Right now, they are funding a lot more of their uh, long-term and short-term uh, requirements from deposits and not from the international money market. So we're seeing that, and we're also seeing a decoupling of commodity prices and the Australian dollar. Never used to see that. They used to be fantastic hedges. Uh, iron ore prices would, uh, would drop. The Australian dollar would drop. We get our receipts in Australian dollars, they would largely act as a hedge. That we haven't seen. In fact, you know, bizarrely we saw iron ore prices come down and the Australian dollar come up. And that, that will take our economy um, a bit of time to deal with. Look, the, you know, the last comment would be all of the aforementioned factors reflect one thing, and I think that's confidence. And uh, 
You talk about confidence, but the, the most telling statistic for me is the net savings rate for Australia and indeed for WA. And uh, for those that follow history, um, in the mid-90s, the net savings rate of Australia was about negative 2%. People spent more than they earned. Um, and as a result, debt increased. In the mid-60s and early 80s, and um, for those of you that are, uh, are old enough uh, to remember the periods, uh, the net savings rates were well above 10%. People were effectively using a large part of their income to uh, reduce debt and, uh, and save. Right now, we are back well above 10%. We've been there for five years. And you know, notwithstanding that our economy is doing well, people are choosing not to spend. Um, and to save and reduce debt. So that will change. There are green shoots. Uh, I think you know, it is one factor which will slowly turn around, but uh, I probably will come back to where I started from, which is it is somewhat subdued. Uh, we are probably doing it much better in WA than the rest of the country, uh, but you know, we still have a way to go. Thanks, Mark. That's a great perspective. And, and I think looking at that last Thing you mentioned there, you know, the savings rate. I think um, if I can turn to Nigel, um, obviously the retail property world is uh, is very much um, aligned to that. I know you've been saying for a couple of years now that this might be the point. Uh, around about September, I think, or this quarter of 2012, um, would be the bottom. We might see the, the 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 green shoots you're talking about. Do you still think that? Or what's 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 the tea leaves telling you now? Well, I think tea leaves are clearly saying up to about 550, uh, we are now at the bottom or very close to. So the things that uh, qualify that is turnover through Landgate is about 15% higher than the same period last year for the last seven months. Uh, each month, the home savings grant for first home buyers is increasing. Uh, we're, we're seeing the uh, <coughs> now the loans. Uh, running at about 18%, that's without refinancing new loans, 18% higher than the same period uh, last year. So all of those things, uh, listings dropping, uh, uh, all of those things are really green shoots. So most probably the market to uh, 700,000 has improved. Over a million dollars, the market is very soft. So uh, it's a real buyer's market, oversupply of products. So we need to see business re-enter uh, what Mark was saying, proper times where people are confident that we are in the soft recovery. Um, the stock market will need to show a lot more strength before that picks up. So I think for first home buyers, for people in the market under 700, things are uh, at the bottom or close to it. Great time to be building a new house. A lot of competition amongst our industry, land developers, and amongst uh, new home builders. So when we have a look at the transactions as we did about a month ago, we're still running below the 15-year average and the 30-year average. So these recoveries, I think, are first signs, even though off a low base. And, and Nigel, just an adjunct question, does it, does it shift, you know, that we're getting volatile news out there? Does that, do you see that on a week-by-week -week basis in we, property? If, if we talk about the resource factor, uh, we, we talk about... Uh, uh, the dropping of the uh, iron ore price uh, last three weeks, we have not experienced that. I was at the coalface in Mandra. Uh, Mandra Murray is the largest and most popular area with fly in, fly out workers. There is no change. So, touch wood, it's fragile consumer confidence, but people are still going about and doing things. And Mandra, as most people know, in the apartment market is what you would call a price cremation, and prices you can't sell. A luxury apartment for half cost. But what we've seen is a recovery in the established house prices to about 475,000 and the stock in Mandra going down. So, you know, that's another good sign about Mandra. Fair enough. Thanks, Nigel. Um, Troy, obviously, from the Treasury position, you've got, a, uh, you've, you've, got a, you've got an election coming, but you've got a budget to deal with as well. Um, and all of these factors, resources and royalties and mm -hmm and property stamp duty, they, they would impact. How are you seeing the state budget right now and where, where it's looking? Oh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, Mark. Um, it, it's a difficult time in WA in one sense. Uh, our sense is that the state's economy, and I think we forecast economic growth 
in the state at around uh, four and a half percent. I noticed some people from my Department of Treasury over there, so when I look over, if they're nodding, I think I got it about right. So I think I'm wrong now. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So about four and a half percent. And um, we don't see uh, a, a significant change in that at the moment, um, and that was largely uh, business investment led. Um, but notwithstanding that, uh, state finances are very tight at the moment, uh, and the main reason is that over the last few years, uh, our, uh, our revenues have become increasingly dependent on royalties. Royalties now account for about $5 billion out of a, around $25 billion uh, of revenue, so it's about 20%. Most of our royalty revenue comes from iron ore. Uh, so we find ourselves in a circumstance where our capacity to deliver um, a surplus is becoming increasingly dependent on movements in the price of iron ore. Uh, just to give you an example, for every dollar, the price, dollar per tonne, US, the price of iron ore moves down, uh, we lose about $33 million. For every, do for every cent the Australian dollar goes up, we lose about $60 million. Uh, and in some ways, it's difficult trying to manage the finances, the accounts of the state when you've got that volatility. Um, right at the moment, I think we're dealing with some cyclical issues around the uh, adjustment in the iron ore price, and I'm, I'm, it's back up above 100 now, and may it rise more rapidly, um, Mark, but, uh, and that's an issue. I, I think there's going to come a point in time, though, and we have to respond to that, uh, and because you know, we need to try and make sure that we live within our means in government. Uh, that is difficult, though. Um, at a point in time, we have to make some decisions around whether that, that cyclical movement uh, is a reflection of a broader structural challenge that we're going to have to deal with. I think we're a little way off that yet, but certainly the volatility in exchange rates is having a big impact on our, uh, on our capacity, or not exchange rates, particularly iron ore price, having a big impact on our capacity uh, to manage the finances. And as Mark pointed out, this traditional hedge between currency movement and commodity price movement has gone, and that's making it more challenging for us. And at the same time, um, uh, because of Nigel's poor performance in the property sector, um, <laughs> good, yeah. our, 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 <laughs> I'd love you to be selling more. Our, our, our property-related revenues are also quite low. You know, our stamp duty rate, uh, stamp duty gross returns on property stamp duty this year are, are well down. You know, seven, eight hundred million dollars down on what they peaked at back in 2006, 2007. So, uh, a lot of negative factors. However, you know, we're, we're uh, I. I think we should be not unlike other businesses uh, or households. We have to try and cut our cloth to suit, and we're certainly doing a little bit of work now what we need to do to manage our finances in a volatile environment. But I think we have to be careful not to talk down the state's economy just because the price of iron ore falls. You know, and I've been a bit shocked at the, this sort of the broader response that the world is finished and WA is kaput. I mean, it isn't. I mean, we are a very, very strong economy. And, you know, over the last five years, average annual economic growth in Western Australia has been 4.6%. In the rest of the nation, it's been about 2.7%. And you don't have to travel far out of Australia to find rates uh, that are w well underneath that. So I think we have to remind ourselves our fundamental, uh, the fundamentals of the Western Australian economy are, are still very strong. And it's uh, something we should be supporting and nurturing uh, rather than continually trying to talk down. Fair enough. Has anyone got anything to add to that to the, from the... Mark, Mark, I think a lot of people forget that we all knew that the iron ore prices would come back, maybe not as quick, but I think the very strong future for revenue for Treasury and for business is uh, the soft rock mining of oil and gas, where we have a very good oil and gas product, which will be go for a long, long time and you know, underpin a lot of things in Western Australia. We seem to forget about that, but I think soft rock mining is going to play a large role moving forward.